Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of Linux, maybe some ideas, and yeah, I'll try not to rant, but it, it may be a, a bit of that. <laughs> we'll see right after. So the reason why I wanted to do this video was to talk a little bit about Linux itself and, and some of the shortcomings that I think uh, that Linux has. But I, you'll, you'll probably notice that those will be in context of Unix a little bit. Uh, and, and so let's, let me tell you why I wanted to do this. First, Linux is fast approaching its 30th birthday. Uh, it's been around a quite a long time, and you know what? It's based on an operating system that's even older. It's based on Unix, and Unix goes back to 1969 on its original design. So here we are about to enter the third decade of the 21st century, and we're still saddled with ideas that were mid-last century. And so that's what I want to talk about. So with that, let's just get started. First problem that I see with Linux is the file system itself. And the reason why that is, is that uh, Unix, which is the perpetrator of this design, used the file cabinet because it was easier for users of that decade to understand uh, how to locate and file information in a, a, a Unix computer based on the model of the file cabinet. And I'm going to bet that a lot of you under 30 and maybe even under 40 have probably never even seen one of those. And so that device doesn't really hold much water today as a viable way to store files. And how does it work? Well, a volume in Linux or Unix is a file cabinet, is the cabinet itself. The directory is the drawers. The, these, these drawers right here that, that run out, that's the equivalent to the, the holding files underneath of it. Now, there is no equivalent to a subdirectory, of course, in a file cabinet. But, uh, and then you have files itself. Those would be the file folders inside the file cabinet, and, and, the, and the papers inside the uh, file folders would be the individual items that are written on that particular file. But just to be clear, high-end computing and high-performance computing abandoned that model a long time ago. And the reason for it was it didn't scale. It didn't scale to file systems that held uh, petabyte of storage. It didn't scale to those files. And it certainly won't scale to those that are going to require exabytes of storage. Well, guess what? In the enterprise world, <laughs> petabyte file systems are, 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 are almost a norm based on the amount of data they're collecting. Exabyte is not very far away. There's probably, there's probably some that are fast approaching the exabyte right now. So, well, okay, great. So in Linux, your file system looks a lot like this. You have a bunch of uh, file folders on top and a bunch of subdirectories underneath of it. Then you have a series of applications, configuration files. You have some data, and you have some databases maybe. And, but that's not your view of it. This is. That's your view of it. So if you were to look for a file in that directory, you would have to know quite a bit of information to find it in this directory structure. You would need to know, uh, first of all, what volume that file was stored on. And you can't recognize from this what, what's a volume. How do you find a volume in that? Well, you can't. You don't know what drive it's actually on. Maybe you don't care, uh, and so you'd have to search through those directories to find your file, and I'm going to bet you'll probably go to a search first to find a file if you're not sure where it is. Um, if you start in your home directory, then you'll go there, and you'll see still see this kind of a representation of how to find your files. So if you know the name, great. If you don't know the name, not so great. So it... So, so what is the problem? It, it's actually easier for you to keep a record of where you store the file on a piece of paper than it is to do a search. It's faster to find a file. That is just plain stupid. Um, so finding some things is pretty easy if you can remember the name. Uh, if, if you don't remember the name, then it's going to be hard. But there's several other th uh, problems with the existing file systems is the way they exist today. Uh, how do you find a file you need? By its name. Or you can run a grep on the file contents and try to locate it that way. Oh, that's going to work real good going across a petabyte volume. 
uh, yeah, I'm sure the, the other users in your organization are going to be real happy with you tying up the entire file system to just find one file. And then multiply that by 1,000 or 10,000 users or even 100,000 users. That's not an answer. Um, what about finding relationships between files? What if uh, maybe some of the data is in one file and, oh, there's some more data that's related to it that I might be interested in. Sorry, not going to find a relationship to the file unless, again, you go back to the eGreep and hope... Uh, or the grab uh, and try to and you hope that uh, maybe you have names that are the similar that are in the file that allow you to link it together in a simple contextual search. Not very practical. What about personalizing the relationships? What about if I want to specify that these are the type of data that I'm interested in because that is my job function? And so <clears throat> I want to automatically have ways to be able to locate that data. I can't do it. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I mean, uh, again, I'd be going back to the Greek to be able to do that, and that's, again, <laughs> that's just not going to work. Uh, the other problem is that the files that are in the file system are protected by a very thin layer called the ACL or the POSIX ACL, the Access Control List. And that, in the 21st century, I'm sorry, guys, but that is not enough. <laughs> in fact, <clears throat> I don't think it's really been adequate for the last 10 years. Um, so <clears throat> the whole design seems like the, it was done in the last century. And guess what? Yeah, it was. It was all designed in the last century. Um, so, okay, uh, what's the answer? Well, I don't have a complete answer. I just have one example of something that might work. And, and you know, I'm just I, I never present a problem unless I know a solution to it. And so one of the solutions I know that HEC uses or the HPC community use is dynamic non-hierarchical file systems. Uh, that is, you store metadata with the file. So I have metadata that's located somewhere in a, like a master directory or something. And about each file I store, <clears throat> I search the metadata, not the file, to find stuff. That. If you want to know uh, a, a workable example of that, go look at the Google page rank. That's how exactly how their system works. So uh, it allows me to also return files that are associated in, in the Google page rank. It also actually, it used to, I, I don't think it does this anymore, but it used to give you a, rele a relevance uh, 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 percentage to say, okay, well, this is about 97% uh, relevant to the search you just did. This file is the one you wanted, but this one is also relevant. This one's also relevant, maybe a little less so, maybe a little less so. And then, so you have a relationship that you can pick there amongst the file systems. Uh, yes, but POSIX metadata already does that, doesn't it? Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. It only does. It's it's homogeneous. It's only text, so it doesn't really. Uh, that's not an answer. Uh, <laughs> it was a good try, but it was not a good answer. I don't store just text files. I store a lot of different kinds of files. I store binary files. I store videos. I store uh, audio files. I store images. So how is that as the POSIX metadata going to help me? Because the metadata among those systems are not the same. Among those different file types are just not the same. Uh, what, what the dynamic non-hierarchical file system does is it creates a heterogeneous, highly uh, dimensional, meaning that uh, it doesn't care what kind of files are in it. It, it. it just, the metadata is provided and is picked out at the time that you staved off the file. I think you probably a lot of you are probably familiar with that if you've used any of the Microsoft uh, Office products. They have a section of metadata that you can fill out. It would be similar. Um, and there's a mixture of numeric, text, categorical, and very sparse, meaning it's very tight, very small, and it works very well across exabytes worth of data. Uh, the downside is as, as the file space grows, the metadata trees get larger, and so you need faster and faster methods to be able to search those directories. And one of the ways that Heck has dealt with it is they break the metadata up, sort of like the inode table works in Linux today where you have uh, sub-factors uh, inside the metadata to, be able to, to try to drill down and find it faster. Uh, and the other thing, it needs to be as secure. In other words, my data has to be tagged in some way so that I know that that data is protected and I, there's a protection level that's stored with the metadata. 
Linux problem number two, server versus workstation. I've always found this kind of odd. Uh, and it's one of the implementations of Linux that inherited this from Unix. Uh, and and it, isn't, it isn't a direct inheritance. This was a deliberate inheritance uh, in order to define the function of a server versus a workstation. Uh, you know, <laughs> Unix, and it's a ri I know I'm going to catch hell for this, but Linux is a time-sharing operating system. Sorry, but it is. It's a time-sharing operating system. It's meant to operate... Uh, to allow, to share its resources among a many, many different users. If you don't believe me, go out and look. There's a Getty. Getty is time sharing, and that is part of the kernel. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really not meant to be a workstation. Why? Servers are time sharing. Servers as service, and they provide time slices of computation to many users. That's what they do, and that's perfect for a server. That is not perfect for a workstation. A workstation is one user. I mean, I don't, I don't have many, I'm looking around, I don't have very many people using my workstation, it's just me. What I need is something that's multitasking, multi-threaded, has parallelism. That's what I need. And unfortunately, that's not the way Linux operates. It's not the way Unix operated either. And so that's a problem. Uh, so. Yeah, a workstation can become a server, and a server can become a workstation, kind of, but, it, but it's neither. It ends up being not good at either if you do that. If you, if you stick a GUI on a server or if you start running services on a workstation, uh, chances are you probably have optimized it to run one way or the other, and so you end up with not, not being very good at either. Uh, so... How did we decide that when we needed Linux to be a server or a workstation? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, it was because it had a work, it had a a monitor, a keyboard, and a and a mouse. That's what determined that it was a workstation. Uh, but there isn't any difference in the code base <laughs> inside of the two. Uh, there there is no differentiation between it. Servers can run user space applications, and workstations can run server based. Uh, applications that run in also in the user space, but they also run their own protocols. They both can switch off. That is, to me, is not good. Uh, but I'll explain why when we get toward a little further on. So a new application or a service. Let's say you want to develop something new for Linux. You want to come up with your own version of the World Wide Web that's completely different than the one that's out there. Okay. Well, the first thing you have to do is you got to have a socket for it. you got to, you got to, you got to have your own socket, and then you're going to have to have your own protocols in order to be able to do that. So you're going to need some server code, some client code, and then you're going to need a set of APIs that allow uh, that system to be extended. And then you're going to end up with a bunch of security things that you're going to need inside of your application if you bother to even do that, right? So, uh, so that's the problems that I see with the current uh, with the current system. So Unix has the same has <laughs> Linux picked up all the same flaws that Unix had, and and put them into the Unix the Linux base. It wasn't by copying the code; it was just by copying the way Unix worked. Graphics and networking were not originally implemented in Unix. It didn't come, Unix was never designed to do graphics and networking. They weren't available technologies at the time Unix was invented. So they're bolt ons. Uh, the graphical user interface, X, X Windows, is a bolt on. It's an application that runs under the uh, kernel. It doesn't run inside the kernel, it runs under it. And so, and I know many of you have seen this. Uh, if uh, your X Windows crashes, what happens to your uh, all your other graphical user applications you had open? Yeah, they go right along with it. Did you get a chance to save when that happened? Yeah, probably not. Right? Probably not. Uh, and so that's a bad thing. I, I don't think that's a good thing at all. The networking thing, yeah, some of it's in the kernel <clears throat> today, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, your, your file transfer protocols, SFTP, your uh, browser, all those things run outside in the user space. All those things have their own set of protocols. All those have their own set of security implementations, and that's a mess. Anytime you have all those kinds of features that are in your system, you're creating a... A footprint for disaster, right? So, 
workstations, uh, PCs appeared about you know in the in the in the, about the mid '80s, about the time of the 386. Yeah, there were PCs running DOS, and there were 286s running DOS. But in the mid '80s, that's really when the workstations became a thing. They didn't integrate very well with Unix. They didn't integrate at all with Unix because uh, they didn't have the same protocols. They didn't have the same operating system. They didn't have the same base of applications. And so, uh, yeah, it was another, here's another bolt-on. And so we ended up having to FTP files to transfer them between the servers and the uh, workstations. We ended up having to tell that in order to open a terminal window on the remote server to be able to execute applications on the back end. Client server wasn't around in the early days. That came later. Uh, we we uh, later on we created the browser. It was uh, Berners Lee and, and company created the World Wide Web and Netscape and uh, all of those companies. Mozilla all created browsers in order to be able to access the uh, HTML streams that came down from the HTTP servers. So that was another set of commands to allow that kind of information to be transferred. We had POP and IMAP originally to transfer email between the servers and the PCs. We had boot P and Pixie in order, if you wanted to remote boot a workstation off of the server, you, they had to implement one of those two protocols, both of which aren't very secure. Um, we had special protocols like RDP and VNC to use a remote uh, computer screen locally, so that I could I can then become I can use the GUI interface on our backend uh, machine that was running a GUI as well. It, and X Windows to provide the client server user interface, and they implemented it backwards, which made it a security a security issue from the very start. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Wayland is attempting to try to correct some of that, but it is just as guilty of having all the same issues that X Windows has, minus a few a, a few core ones that they have improved on in, in Wayland. It isn't very significant. It's still wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? Because none of this is seamless. Uh, I have separate applications doing different things, and I have to have different ports open. I have to have different protocols running. That's just stupid. Sorry, <laughs> but it is. Plan 9 implemented a solution to that called the 9P. Uh, the 9P protocol allowed them to have one set of protocols that applications could utilize. Uh, each machine connected to a Plan 9 network provides a specific class of services. So what defines a server? What defines a workstation? What defines it is what it's running. Uh, so if, like, for example, if I had a multiprocessor host, that would, that would probably become a compute node. If I had a, a large machine with a lot of disk drives on it, that probably is going to be my file store. Uh, workstations provide the human-to-computer interface, of course. Uh, but it's all the same OS. It's the same apps, the same package management, the same configuration. That's what I. That's what Plan Nine wanted to create. They wanted to get rid of all that nonsense that was in uh, the Unix and Linux. Now, am I saying that Linux should become Plan Nine? No, absolutely not. But it doesn't hurt to borrow some of the ideas that, that uh, Rob Pike and, and Dennis Ritchie had. They certainly knew what they were doing, and they certainly did come up with something that was pretty well designed and thought out. So. How do applications communicate in Plan 9? They use a key. You can't access the application without a key. They're, everything is encrypted. So you can't even connect to the application that, unless you have a key to use that app. So <laughs> you're not going to be able to jump on the machine and just exfiltrate data through the application anymore. That won't work. Uh, each window that's opened on the workstation runs in its own user space. Hmm, sounds like cubes, doesn't it? Uh, Linux has been trying to do this, but the solutions have been really, really insecure, and they've been really difficult to administer. Also, they've been, I would guess, I would say this ba basically is they've been piecework. They have not been thought about as a ubiquitous design. I know that the uh, Linux Foundation is busy working on the enterprise side of things, and they really don't care about the workstation. I'm not sure what the right approach is to solve this, and I'm hoping that maybe some of you out there who are involved with, uh, with the developers and developing the systems will, will realize that, yes, this is indeed a problem that we need to solve. 
And I think it is. I, I think it's only going to get worse if we don't solve this problem and come up with a way to secure the system, redesign it. I, I don't know if that means we throw Linux out and start over or we just pull Linux apart and start working on it piecemeal until we reassemble it back into something that's usable. Uh, because the way it sits now, it's not good. It's not good at all, in my humble opinion. So, number three, the file server. So, data has to be transferred from one place to another. I'm moving my data to the application, right? So, uh, and then if you've got petabytes worth of data stores <laughs> moving across the network, you're going to retire before that's going to get done. Uh, backup, same problem. I mean, you're copying the data from one location to another in bulk. And so, yeah, you're going to be retired before that data gets moved over to the other side. Uh, it's just, I mean, if you don't believe me, go. have you ever tried to transfer 40 to 50 terabytes over a network? Yeah, it applies to terabyte file systems as well as it does petabyte. It could take weeks, maybe even a month to move the data across the Internet with that much. Uh, the Linux file servers can run user processes. That's ah, a red flag. Guess how exfiltration occurs? <laughs> it occurs because they get access to an application that has it. Um, so I don't have the greatest answer to this, but I'll give you some thoughts uh, on, on what I think. Um, wouldn't it be faster to just ship the application over to the, use the data? So if I need data on a machine, wouldn't it be quicker to just move the app over, have it pick up the data that it wants, and then stream it back? Uh, and maybe I could have some filters on that data so that I can get what I'm interested in instead of the entire <laughs> whatever size that particular data set happens to be. Let's say it's 10 terabytes. I don't want all that. I'm probably not even interested in more than 10% of it, maybe even 1% of it. Give me, what, give me the data back that I'm interested in. I don't want the whole thing downloaded to my machine just to be able to read a, a, a couple of paragraphs out of a document. Um, so, I mean, that's what I think. And, 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 you know, instead of flooding my network with all this junk, move the application. That's simpler. Uh, data backups, synchronized. Synchronize them to the changes so that you're moving just the changes across the network as they occur. Yes, that's going to get busy in a really busy network. Absolutely, that's going to get busy. But uh, you know what? It's better to probably do things a little bit at a time. And guess what? you have a better backup because <laughs> you're not waiting on it to occur once a day or once a week, whatever your schedule happens to be. So those are just my thoughts. It's not a perfect solution. I'd love to hear what you guys think about that. But uh, oh, here's a big one. Administration and configuration of Linux. That's a big problem. Uh, if you've ever configured Linux system for a specific set of tasks, you're pretty much stuck with that. Uh, unless you want to blow it away, because you're going to end up with libraries out there. Let's say that it changes from an HTTP server over to maybe a, 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 a file cluster server. Well, you, you're not going to get rid of all those libraries because a lot of them get hooked into the uh, other the uh, other dependencies that are in your system. And so when you go to remove them, you may not have an operational system anymore. I've encountered that many times, and I'm sure you have too. Um, Sure, you can orchestrate compute servers using Docker and, and Kubernetes, absolutely. It's a good start, but it's the wrong idea. All you ever, all you really end up there is more servers that you have to uh, administer. <laughs> Don't think that's the answer. Uh, the configurations also in, 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 in Linux, Windows too, by the way, uh, differ by function. So if I set up a file server, my configuration for a file server is different than one that's serving web. They're totally different. So over time, you'll end up with a tangled mess of applications, libraries, and supporting applications as things change in the, in the uh, system. Sooner or later, you're going to have to obliterate that server and rebuild it from scratch in order to get rid of all the bloat and the fluff that's left over from stuff you're no longer using. And I remember a couple of times way back, uh, well, it wasn't way back, it was a couple of years ago, where we found servers that were still running it. And so we, the way we found out if anyone was using it, we just turned it off for a day and see who called. Because we had no idea what the servers were being used for. Nobody bothered to record what their function was. Nobody knew what they were. And yeah, sure enough, we had some users call and say, hey, what happened to our server? So yeah, that happens. Uh, and if you don't believe me that, the, that they get a mess over time, install Ansible. 
Uh, I'm picking on Ansible, but it's not just unique to Ansible. And then have two servers. One's Debian and one's Red Hat. You're going to end up writing two sets of code <laughs> in order to be able to handle those two servers. And they're totally different in the way, even though they're both Linux, the application base, the package management, the library functions, they're all named differently. Uh, not, not to mention that you have deb files versus RPM. That's another difference that you have. So, and again, I'm not picking on Ansible. They're all guilty of it. <laughs> you can pick on whoever you like uh, anyway. So whether it be Salt or Chef or whatever you prefer, or Puppet, uh, they're all going to have that same problem because there isn't any consistency in the Linux systems and how they do things. Uh, administration. So administration of a server on Linux is a heck of a lot easier than a workstation. And the particular problem that you have with workstations is the GUI configuration. Not to mention, if a user goes in and modifies the way their terminal looks and their workstation look and feel is different, that means that if you have 10,000 people in your organization, that's 10,000 uh, files, somebody has to administer. That's not feasible either. That's just, that's just not good. Um, so why do they need to be different? Why, why do I have KDE? Why do I have GNOME? Why do I have XFDC? Uh, XF... <laughs> XFDCE. Uh, why do I have all these different things? It wasn't. It wasn't one GUI enough. I mean, uh, change is nice, but I can't put it inside the operating system if I have all these things that are that are different. Uh, wouldn't it be better to just come up with a way to redefine how the GUI looks for me to be able to modify what I want it to look like, and and leave the core code inside of the kernel? Uh, and I mean, the GUI today uh, is all outside the kernel. This doesn't make any sense. So uh, the GUI can definitely be inside the OS. Plan 9 proved that. Um, the 8.5, which is their version of, uh, of the GUI interface, ran inside the kernel. So, yeah, it, it's not, it, it didn't take a whole lot of code to do that. And they had one prototype where I don't remember exactly how many lines of code, but it was under, it was well under a couple thousand, uh, I think. Uh, it's been a while, <laughs> so. But uh, I'm sure that we could do it better than they did. I mean, uh, given the amount of information and knowledge we have. I mean, not to mention that how many different ways can you write a GUI under Linux? Uh, you know, you have <laughs> the old-fashioned X11. You also have Qt. Uh, you have all these different mechanisms that you can use. I, I just don't understand why this hasn't been standardized. So. I'll get off my soapbox and I'll just close with some closing <laughs> remarks. Uh, Linux and Unix are terribly old designs. And yes, they work and they work very well, but they could be better. Um, they could be a lot better. Uh, to me, a computer should be defined by what it does, not by what its configuration is. Uh, there is some old designs in computer hardware that were configurationless. And they function based on how the system uh, applications were assembled. They didn't require configuration to do that. Um, it, would, it should be seamless to open a window and run an application that I want in that window. It also should be protected so that if the X server crashes, it doesn't knock down every single window I have open. Yeah, did you get a chance to save <laughs> when that happened? I know it's happened to you. It's happened to me many times where the X window X uh, X org has uh, blown itself out of the water and taken everything on the screen with it. Um, I should be able to locate the data that I need, but I also want to see what else is, might be related to it, right? Um, I can't do that, not easily. And it certainly couldn't do it across a petabyte worth of data. Uh, I would have people probably pounded on my door saying, stop that. Um, I'd like to see a common set of OS, a common set of applications, and with consistent names across the board. I'd like to see a, a common set of configurations uh, for server and workstation. It shouldn't make any difference what they are and how they're running. To me... I mean, the Debian, Red Hat, Arch folks, and all the rest, that'll get in a room. Which package manager is it going to be, guys? Do we really need 20? Come on. This is stupid. Um, also, also, while you're in that room, decide on how the format of the configuration files are going to be and where you're going to put them. Uh, 
this isn't rocket science. I mean, you just have to sit in a room and agree. Maybe what we do is we, we stick you in a room, we lock it with bread and water in it until you, in, until you either you figure it out or you're <laughs> out of bread and water. I don't know what the right, I'm just being silly, but, um, you know, it, it isn't, this isn't rocket science. It's just a matter of people talking to each other and coming up with a set of standards that they all can live with. Um, we've done it before. POSIX, more or less, <laughs> was an agreement between the companies. Uh, that were doing these things, and they came to an agreement. So I don't know why the Linux people can't do the same thing. Uh, and put the GUI in the OS already. I mean, it, it, <laughs> Xorg has been sitting outside the kernel since about 1985. Don't you think it's about time that you started pushing the stuff back inside the kernel and getting rid of this application so that you can protect it? So if applications crash, they don't cause the, uh, the Xorg to go down with it? Uh, I mean, that's kind of the why we use Linux in the first place is we have the protected kernel. Don't you think we ought to extend that a little bit maybe to the GUI as well? it would be kind of nice. Um, encrypt everything and don't allow connections to other servers without a key. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a DES key. I don't care if it's a, a symmetrical or asymmetrical key. It doesn't make any difference to me. But that entitles that person. If they have the key, that person then is entitled to use that app. No key, no connection. And that means no data. It doesn't mean I can encrypt the data or decrypt the data. It means I can't even connect. <clears throat> uh, take SFTP, NFS, and Samba and all the other trash and replace it. Get rid of it. Uh, don't need it. Uh, replace it with streams. Put, it, put some filters out there that allow me to just look at the data that's coming across. And that means you can move the application over to the data because you don't need to be transferring the data anymore. I mean, a petabyte, uh, if I'm storing petabytes worth of files, I probably have a few that are probably in the 50, maybe even 100 terabytes range. And I'm going to be trying to move. That's not feasible to come across a network. I don't care if you have a 100 terabyte network connection. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for today. <laughs> Those are my thoughts. I would love to hear what you guys think. Uh, you know, if you have some other ideas that you'd like to tack on to mine, I think it's time to start thinking about uh, Linux in terms of where it is, in terms of its age, and where it should go. I'm not advocating for throwing the ba uh, you know the baby out with the bathwater. I hope that. Uh, you know that some of these things that we could implement easily inside the, the, the Linux kernel. It isn't all now. Maybe the file system is going to be a little tougher because that's kind of central to everything the way Linux works. But I think we could probably do it. I think there's some things that we can definitely do to improve it. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video today. Uh, it took me a while to put this together because I, I really wanted to understand. Uh, some of the thoughts that were out, you know, in, and try to remember all the things that I remember from Plan 9 from years ago. Plan 9 was uh, originally started by Bell Labs, and it was really designed to replace all of the poor designs that were in Unix and try to incorporate all of the things into uh, Plan 9 that were shortfalls in Unix. And, and uh, anyway, so uh, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again very soon, and bye for now.